I was with some friends from my preaching cohort this last week, and conversation naturally turned to, what are you preaching this coming Sunday? And I said to them, Psalm 137. And they said, what? You're doing Psalm 137? And one of them said to to me, do you know the Philip Yancey's story about Psalm 137? I said, no. And he said, well, Anyway, for those of you who don't know Philip Yancey, he's a New York Times best-selling author. He's a Christian author. Wrote uh, one book, really noteworthy book, called What's So Amazing About Grace. And apparently, I haven't tracked this down, but uh, allegedly, Philip Yancey and his brother grew up uh, in churches, going to youth groups, kind of doing the thing, going to all the different youth groups. And what they found was there was this pattern. People would ask them, what's your name? And what's your favorite Bible verse? Like, that's really welcoming. <laughs> We don't do that at St. Mo's because I realize a lot of us haven't grown up in the church, might be new to the church. We're not going to ask you what your favorite Bible verse is. We will ask you, what is your greatest sin? Just kidding. We're not going to do that. <laughs> so they would be asked, what is your favorite Bible verse? And these kids knew enough of the Bible. They were jokesters. And so one of them took to saying, oh, yeah, uh, my, my name is uh, Philip, and my favorite Bible verse is Psalm 137, verse 9. You know, the kids are expecting, like, John 3.16 or whatever. So they bust out the Bible, and they'd be like, look at, look at, look at, look, where, where are Psalms? And they'd find it, and they'd start scanning down the page, and then they'd get to Psalm 137, verse 9, and they'd be like, what? <laughs> that, my friends, is fair warning uh, that where we are going today is difficult. Really challenging verses. Uh, we, we'll, we'll get to them in time. But particularly the end of this psalm is graphic and upsetting, and I just want to warn you, and particularly if you have uh, kids with you in the service, just know uh, that's where things head this morning. The imagery is is really uh, challenging. But I think it's important. And the question that I want to lob your way just as we begin is, what do you do with your anger? I found myself when we were living in Baton Rouge one day running around the lakes And I was at about the five mile mark, running faster than I normally am at the two mile mark. And I was like, what is going on here? Why, why, where is this energy coming from? Because it's not because I've been training. (laughs) It's not because I'm in shape. And I realized that I was angry. I felt betrayed by a friend. I felt let down by God and deeply, deeply angry. And my feet were pounding the pavement. What do you do with your anger? Do you run? Do you eat? Do you not eat? Do you lash out, you lash in, you shout, you go quiet. What do you do with your anger? When we began this short series in the Psalms a few weeks ago, we said that the Psalms in many ways are a gift to us because uh, in some forms of religion, it sort of truncates our human emotional experience. It says you can have emotions as long as they're between here and here, as long as they are between between remorse for your sin and joy in Jesus. And if you want to get really wild, you can add a little bit of honoring your parents. And on the other hand, pop psychology today says, no, the whole range of human emotional experience is not only to be embraced, but your emotions, your appetites are the only, the best guide into what is good and what is true and what is right for you. Wildly different philosophies. And when we come to the Psalms, we discover that God in the Psalms has not written off our emotional experience. And nor has he told us that our emotions are king. He has instead normalized the entire range of human emotional experience and always set it in reference to God as creator. God as kind, God as wise, and God who is in control. To sharpen that, the Psalms, in the hand of God's Spirit, help us to become more fully human because they help us to embrace who we are now and who God is helping us to become. What a gift just want to give you a a little peek at where we're going this morning. We're going in a minute to look at Psalm 137. Um, It is 
one of a set of psalms that are called the imprecatory psalms or maledictory psalms, which is just both big fancy words to meaning like cursing up a storm psalms. The part of a set of psalms that we talked about earlier called the lament psalms, the songs that are crying out to God, the, the psalms that are exploring the gap between what the rest of the psalms say about how good God is and our lived experience. So we're going to dip into Psalm 137 in a minute. It falls nicely into three sections. So after I pray, we're going to walk quickly through those three sections. I'll make some observations. And then we'll step back from Psalm 137. We will ask, what, does, what can we learn from this type of psalms in general? How are these curse psalms helpful to us in growing up to become like Jesus? And then I'm going to end uh, a little bit um, sooner this morning because I want to save time for one of our dear members and musicians, Hyana, to share some of her uh, experience um, of trauma, of pain, and of God's grace uh, in the middle of that. And um, So I'd ask you to pray for her. Her story is uh, profound and, um, and is uh, at the heart of, of what's going on here in Psalm 137. So I'm going to pray and we'll jump in. Father, would you be with us this morning? You know we need your help. These words are ancient, uh, but in some ways they pick scabs uh, that are in all of us. And we ask that you, as our loving Father, would not stand far off, but would come among us by the Spirit of Jesus. Where we are wounded, bring your balm. Where we are in shackles, put on shackles with us. Where we are in broken marriages, enter the pain with us. Where we are betrayed, we know you have been too. Come help us become more like Jesus. Help us experience your grace as we read this psalm this morning. Verses 1 through 3 go this way. Beside the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept as we thought of Jerusalem. We put away our harps, hanging them on the branches of poplar trees, for our captors demanded a song from us. Our tormentors insisted on a joyful hymn. Sing us one of those songs of Jerusalem. But how can we sing the song of the Lord while in a pagan land? The setting is this, around 586 B.C., God's people, the Jewish people, were dragged out of their raised homes. They were hauled away from the now rubbled temple to a distant land. They were taken to the city of Babylon, which was actually in many ways a beautiful city, but it was not home. It was a foreign city, and they were not there as guests. They were there as captives. So although the song opens with this beautiful line beside, of the, beside the rivers of Babylon, which might sound really exotic to us, like, oh, I'd like to go there, and we're all on uh, uh, Expedia, look, kind of booking tickets. For these people, the people writing these songs, for the pe first people hearing these songs or singing these poems, beside the waters of Babylon, it's a way of talking about Auschwitz. That's how you talked about the Trail of Tears. That's how you talked about the antebellum plantations in the south of Jim Crow. And in this turn of phrase that, in terms of poetry, is just gorgeous, and in terms of life experience, is ghastly, the songwriter says, we're not going to sing. He sings a song about not singing, or she sings a song about not singing. He says, we're going to hang up our instruments. We're going to put our harps in the trees, and we're not going to sing the song you are asking us to sing. Because it says their captors or their tormentors, those are the words that it uses of the Babylonians. It says, they're asking us to sing a song of the homeland. Come on, sing us one of those ditties. We love your spiritual, sing them. And they say, no. We're not going to sing. We're going to weep. We're going to hang up our harps. Just a sidebar here. 
the Psalms, the Lament Psalms, the wisdom literature in the Bible in general, that's books like Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, are tremendous, tremendously helpful for those of us who will listen in understanding human emotion and knowing how to treat and how not to treat one another. I don't know whether these, torment, these captors were asking them to sing songs out of malevolence or whether they were just thoughtless. But either way, it was excruciating for the Jewish people. Proverbs 25.20 puts it this way. It's just it's such a perfect turn of phrase. Often our instinct when we encounter people in pain is to try to cheer them up, Right? I think that has a lot more to do with our comfort than it has to do with trying to enter their pain. Proverbs 25, 20 says, like one who snatches away a coat on a winter day, like one who pours vinegar on a wound is one who sings songs of joy to the sorrowful. Wow. Isn't that helpful? Isn't that helpful for us just in, in how we treat one another? But if you think about it, not in the human dimension, but in, the, in our relationship with God, doesn't that verse help us to see what a good, what a kind, what a loving God God is to us? Because even the, the, the most pastoral pastors I know, and I know some, and the tenderest counselors and therapists I know, and there are some of them in this room, often have to remind ourselves, often have to, to boost ourselves to, to lean in, to to. to to approach the fray of another person's emotional experience, right? Normally our instinct is to hold it at arm's length, to, to, to tune it out, to turn it down, try to change it with something joyful or funny immediately. And our loving Father does not do that. He does not tear away your coat on a winter day. He bends down, he leans in, he listens sits in the grief with us. And look at this. He supplies us with words to express to him our most heartfelt experiences. Even if those experiences are telling us that it seems like he's not there. Even if those experiences are telling us that it seems like he doesn't care, he's supplying the words. And if you're like me, by which I mean a guy who finds emoji charts really helpful for pinpointing my emotions. A guy who prefers to kind of stuff or scoff at or laugh at emotions rather than process them. What a gift. What a kind God. Who doesn't say, come on, sing Kumbaya. He bends down, he leans in. And he supplies to us words to speak to him faithfully. Even if it's speaking about our doubts that he exists or that he's good. Or expressing our lament of the way the world is. Let's press on. Verses 5 through 7. 5 and 6, sorry. If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget how to play the harp. May my tongue stick to the roof of my mouth if I fail to remember you, if I don't make Jerusalem my greatest joy. So the, the songwriter finds him or herself now in Babylon, and as he or she looks around at Babylon, even though it's a beautiful place, even though it's a flourishing city, all the psalmist can think about is what has been taken away. All of the, humanly speaking, all of the artifacts of identity and meaning, family, place, job, all of that has been stripped away. What remains is this. A big, gaping hole of this is not the thing that was taken from me. So the songwriter's mind goes back to Jerusalem. And it's interesting how he frames it up. It's almost like he invokes these curses upon himself. It's like he's afraid that he will forget Jerusalem because he's not there anymore. Do you see that? 
home, family, location, place, meaning all of that has been stripped away and all that I have now is the memories and if I lose those, that's even worse and it's almost like that last bit is my fault. So the psalmist is afraid of losing memories. Do you see that sadness and fear? Sadness of loss and fear all hand in hand. And what we're about to go in a moment, the way that the note the psalm ends on is very definitely anger. Loss, sadness, fear, anger. But it's instructive to us, I think, just as we walk with each other through life's laments and for our own purposes to recognize how these things are tied together. And not always in the order that the psalm presents them, because remember the psalm is, this is, this is the product of, this is the artistic expression of processed loss and grief. In fact, sometimes these emotions come in the inverse order. They seize us in the opposite order of the psalm very often. I was listening to a podcast. I shared it on Slack. Some of you have listened to it several months ago. And uh, that podcast, a, a man shared about his experience of watching his little girl begin to grow up. And as he was observing her, he had suspicions that she would spend her life struggling with autism. And he seethed with anger. As he watched the kind of gap between her achievement and the kind of benchmark milestones just widen. He was angry. And he stayed up late at night Googling this, and he became like this online expert of autism, and he was just afraid, so afraid, that he wouldn't even share what he was discovering with his wife. And in this anger and in this fear, it felt like God was absent, like God didn't care if he existed. Or maybe just like God was impotent, could do nothing about it. And the breakthrough, at least in this man's story, came around the time of the daughter's diagnosis. They were in the doctor's office, and he confirmed the dad's worst fears. And as the dad and the mom wept together, as they mourned the loss the death of all of those, those dreams that they had had for the daughter about a quote-unquote normal life. As they wept together, he moved out of anger, and he felt God's presence with him in the grief. And what I took away from his story, one of the things I took away from his story is that anger and fear are very often sentry, what I'm calling sentry emotions. They warn us, don't they? They can warn us. They're not rational to start with, but they can be warnings to us. You have experienced loss and grief is coming. But it's easy for us to be afraid of grief, right? Loss is painful, and for some of us, we'd rather camp out in the fear and the anger And the way forward is through the anger, through the fear, into the pain of loss and grief. And God goes with us. It's interesting, uh, we talked the first week about the way the book of Psalms is structured into five books, into clusters, and this is, the last, this is in the last of the five books of the book of Psalms. It's focusing on the experience of the pilgrim journeying towards the promised land. And this psalm is a poignant reminder that there are still moments of fear and of anger in the middle of that journey. Two psalms on, though, one, Psalm 139, is reflecting on exactly the same experience, the exile. But instead of resolving in anger, Psalm 139 harps on God's presence with us in the middle of that experience. Let's go now to the last 
few verses, uh, fair warning, this is where it gets uh, pretty upsetting. <laughs> you guys are like, this has all been upsetting, Ian. What are you talking about? Oh Lord, remember what the Edomites did on the day the armies of Babylon captured Jerusalem. Destroy it, they yelled. Level it to the ground. Oh Babylon, you will be destroyed. Happy, another translation is blessed or content, is the one who pays you back for what you have done to us. Happy is the one who takes your babies and smashes them against the rocks. Psalmist's mind at this point is going back to the precipitating moment, the, the moment of the trauma when they were snatched from their homes in Jerusalem. And what he remembers firstly, or she remembers firstly, is the jeers of the Edomites. There's a family story here. Some of you know the name Jacob. Jacob's other name was Israel. He is the ancestor of the entire Israelite people. And he had a twin brother, older by a few minutes, named Esau. And Esau became the ancestor of another nation called the Edomites. And these two people groups lived more or less side by side as neighbors in modern day Israel, Palestine, and Jordan. We don't know specifically what happened, but what it seems like is on the day the Babylonians came in and raised Jerusalem to the ground and dragged the, the, the Jewish people away into exile, their neighbors, their kin, the Edomites, cheered and facilitated. Put that in context, that's like if one of our enemy, enemies invaded the United States and our neighbors to the north, the Canadians, we've got some Canadians here, so this is just a Go on! Do it! Yeah! Just so they could sneak down and get some real bacon. <laughs> it's betrayal. It's betrayal. Moves on then to asking for... to celebrating, to, to expressing this wish that someone in God's hand would do something heinous to the Babylonian children as something heinous had been done to the Jewish children. And there's no way around it. I mean, it, we're not going to dress this up. <laughs> we're not going to say it isn't what it is. It is a bald-faced, angry, seething, retributive plea for revenge. For for maybe by God's hand, revenge, but nonetheless, that something terrible, terrible would happen. Those who had done something terrible to the psalm writer and his or her people. What I want to do now is to step back a little bit from this psalm to these imprecatory, maledictory psalms in general and ask us, how on earth can this be helpful for us as we try to grow up in Jesus, as we long to become more like him? Because isn't this just heinous? And some of us are like, well, actually, I really resonate with that. I mean, that is honest. I have felt in myself the longing for revenge. And others of us are like, I, that's heinous. So let's step back for a moment and, and ask ourselves in what ways are these psalms helpful to us as we grow up in Jesus? This is by no means a comprehensive answer, but I want to point three directions briefly and then turn over to Hannah. Here's the first one. In C.S. Lewis's little book, really helpful book called Reflections on the Psalms, he says that the, 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 these cursed psalms, they normalize anger. Actually, he doesn't say that. What he says is they express that anger in the face of injustice is natural camps out on that word natural. It's almost like there's this anthropological calculus we, do, we can do where we can put an equal sign between injustice, the experience of injustice, and anger, and another equal sign between the anger and the desire for revenge. They're natural. It's not saying that it's right. It's not saying that they are expressed correctly, but we can say that it is natural. And isn't it, in the first instance, just profoundly helpful to notice that God normalizes for us in the Psalms this experience. Leaving aside for the for moment whether or not it's, it's right, but he, he in a sense validates it. He at least normalizes it. You will experience this. 
your anger in the face of injustice is natural. Other people's anger, this is a very helpful place to take it, other people's anger in the face of injustice to them is natural. And this was on my heart this last week. In the face of the public debate about Columbus Day and uh, Indigenous Peoples Day. I don't know where you land on on those sort of political questions about specific holidays, but as Jesus followers who have this book of Psalms in our laps, we need to begin by recognizing that anger is a natural response to injustices experienced. And if history instructs us in one thing, it tells us this, that the dominators often want to write the story as if all is well. The narrative is all is well. We can imagine the Babylonians saying to their Jewish captives, look, Babylon has rivers. Jerusalem was dry. We've got a good economy here. Sing your song. lament psalms remind us as Christians that we need to not undermine society but pick away at undermine the dominant narrative that says all is well because it ain't and we can say that clear eyed because in Jesus we know that all shall be well but it isn't yet Our tendency, particularly if you are part of a group that has perpetrated injustice, is to forget quickly. And these lament psalms help to disable our forgetfulness. Number one, it naturalizes, normalizes our anger and the anger of others. Number two, The lament psalms, the curse psalms, help us to express our anger, to vent our anger in a safe direction. The other day, we had our first neighbor group at our house, which was a delight, packed all these people into our living room. And just after everybody was in, there was a knock on the door, and this BGE guy came to inspect our boiler, and he walked in, he looked at us all sitting barefoot in a circle around candles singing curse psalms, and he was like, just kidding, we weren't doing that. (laughs) We were there, but we were not singing curse psalms. He walks in, he's like, what is going on? I was like, I'll take you to the boiler. I took him to the basement, and uh, he started, he was like, first, move all these flammable things away from your boiler. He's like, okay, I can do that. And uh, and then he said, see, here's the safety release valve for this zone. And when that one fails, here's the safety release valve for, for, for that. And when that one fails, well, sorry. And in a sense... Insofar as the lament psalms, the curse psalms, normalize our anger, they also show us that there is a safe way. There is a good way. There is a a faithful way to express it that is not taking up your fists and that isn't necessarily verbalizing it to the person that you are angry at, but is that expressing it to God. You know, our music is full of lament. Think of uh, um, Garth Brooks and, and the thunder rolls, right? The pain of pain of infidelity, or Kanye West and the touching the sky, the struggle of making it, full of lament. But that's that's not worship. It's not worship. It's not worship until we express our lament or our anger, or our grievance or our doubt to God, because when we express it to Him. That's in a way acknowledging that we believe he exists, that, that, that we believe he's disposed to care about the things that we're saying. That he has the putative ability to do something about it. So these psalms show us that we can faithfully, worshipfully express anger and even our urge to, to revenge to God. And that's safe. And that's healthy. Last thing I want to say before I hand off to Hannah is that these cursed psalms help us to move through. 
through loss and fear and anger and the desire for revenge. I don't want to say that in a glib way. But as much as these psalms, psalms like 137, are a gift, they are not the only thing God says about pain and revenge. In fact, when we hold them up against the vast arc, the big swing of the story of the Bible, it lands confidently and resolutely on the footing that says human revenge is not the way forward through anger, through loss. Romans 12, God says to his people, vengeance is mine. Don't take it up in your own hands to avenge yourselves. It's mine to repay. And of course, when we look at some of the closing chapters of the Bible, we get to Revelation chapter 18, and and you'll see all through the book of Revelation, the the name Babylon, of course, at that point, not referring specifically to, to Babylon or the Babylonians, but referring just to, 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 to Rome and to perpetrators of injustice in general, we see that God does deal justly. You could look concretely at history and see, in fact, the Persians did pay back, in a sense, the Babylonians. You could see, in a sense, the, the Romans were paid back for what they did to the Jews, in a sense. But when you look at the book of Revelation, chapter 18, all, in, all perpetrators of injustice are dealt with in God's justice. But where the story really crystallizes is the day that God is among his people. And Jesus is betrayed by those closest to him his own followers, his own friends. Maybe in this instance, not acting like the Babylonians, but certainly acting like the Edomites. They sell him out, Judas does. The others, to a man, abandon him. And as he hangs on a cross, the only righteous judge, paying for their injustices, their perpetrations of injustice, their sin, their betrayal, their violence against him and against each other. He pleads, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. So Paul, when he's reflecting on this, the church in Ephesus, he says, be tender with one another, chapter 4. Don't nurse a grudge against one another. But as those who have been forgiven, you also must forgive. I want to invite Hina up, and I'm just going to pray uh, to close this section and to pray for Hina. Father, you are so merciful and so kind, and you meet us in the depth of our pain and in the depth of our desire for revenge sometimes. We pray that you would come do the work that you need to do in our hearts as individuals, in our hearts as a church, with people from a range of different ethnicities, a range of different backgrounds, a range of different nations. Would you help us to be, in some ways, um, good inheritors of the legacy of our St. Moses? who himself was slow to judge and quick to forgive because he knew just how much he'd been forgiven. We pray that you will be with Hina, that you give her strength and courage, and thank you for your glory and her story. Thank you for her courage in helping us with her story. I know it's my story, but I wrote stuff down so that I don't get lost in my... I invite you to imagine 
<clears throat> a young mom, 25 years old, whose um, husband just got shot and killed in a carjacking. And um, their five and a half month old baby taken in the car. And add to that that this all happened in a church parking lot um, on a very cold Sunday evening that just so happened to be a Valentine's Day. Um, we often say that bigger the pain and issues and grief, um, even bigger is God's grace. Um, I was that young widow. Uh, my, li my life literally got upended that night uh, without any warning uh, and no time to prepare for the unspeakable grief that pushed its way into my heart and into my life. Um, it was almost 25 years ago. It's hard to believe that the pain is still very raw. Um, my late husband, Young, was a wonderful man. He was funny, he was exceptionally bright, he was good looking, he really was. <laughs> Strong, he was sweet, kind, warm, very generous, he was gentle and patient, and he was an incredible cook. He was very stubborn, but that's for another time. <laughs> we would have celebrated our second wedding anniversary in 12 days. And Young was a faithful follower of Christ. Um, actually, he was baptized my dad, by my dad, who's not here today, uh, before we started dating. Um, so Young had my dad's seal of approval. My dad loved Young. Everyone, actually, loved Young. Uh, so after he finished his PhD in computer science, we got married, and we moved to Philly, Philadelphia. Uh, <clears throat> and he was very quickly recognized as a beautiful Christian with an exceptional gift um, of leadership. In fact, that Sunday morning, Valentine's Day 1993, that morning on Sunday, he was ordained as a deacon. Who would have imagined that God would take him only hours after? When um, Young and I arrived uh, back at church that Sunday evening to uh, lead the special worship service that was organized by the Young Married Couple uh, group, which Young was leading, and Daniel was fast asleep uh, in his car seat. Uh, Daniel had a cold, and he was fussy and cranky all day. And so Young decided that, you know, we'll let Daniel sleep just a little more. So he asked me to, you know, go in first because I was leading a choir practice. And I still remember looking back at the car, seeing Young sitting with a hymnal open on the wheel. He was practicing with the engine on to get the heat going. It was very cold that day. Um, that was the last time I saw him alive. Literally minutes after um, two juvenile brothers who wanted a joyride um, shot Young three times, point blank, uh, in the heart, and took our car uh, with Daniel still strapped, but miraculously, by God's grace, Daniel was found two hours later, 20 blocks west from the church, still strapped in his car seat. He was thrown out into the back alley um, near a tr you know, trash bin with stray dogs roaming around. And I remember talking to my mom on the phone that night because she and my dad were visiting Sam in Chicago. He was there then, because they got the news. And I remember telling my mom, Mom, I know, I really know 
And I believe that God can bring Young back. That God can bring him back to life. And so, Mom, please pray that God, please pray, pray God to bring Young back. Because I believe that, you know, I, I do believe and I did believe that Jesus brought Nazareth, right? Back to life after three days after being buried. And I really honestly believed that God could do that. I knew he could. And I asked, but he didn't. I blamed everyone. Um, I even blamed poor Daniel, who was just an infant. Um, I fainted a lot, and I almost lost my mind. Um, it was the, actually the first fatal carjacking in Philly, and I was angry with everything people said. Um, you know, all the well-wishers, the words of condolences, all that just cut right through my heart. I wanted people to just shut up. There was no word that would make me feel better. When people said, Hyuna, you're strong. You can do it. You know, you'll be okay. You, know, you have such strong faith. You have a lot of people who love you. We're here for you. And I said, right, etc. They all just made me more angry to hear those words. I didn't, but I wanted. I wanted to tell them, oh, really? Well, let's see if uh, you would still say that, if this happened to you. I even went as far as saying, you know, maybe it should happen to you. <laughs> and I remember seeing Young in my dreams and telling him, honey, I thought you were dead. And I said, thank God it was only a dream. And then waking up, realizing that it was not a dream. You know, still to this day, actually there's nothing more I'd want than to get young back. But I can honestly say that God has been good to me. God has been faithful in my walks <laughs> past 25 years. Uh, God took young away from me, um, who was, I thought, was everything to me. But God filled that void um, with unbelievably loving family and friends and many, many of them. And this beautiful gift of music um, through which I find healing. I find healing and through which his, God's love channels through. Um, I actually consider this pain a gift now. It's a gift because I didn't ask for it. It was just given to me. But because of it, um, I can better approach people with my music. And, um, I mean, I dare not say that my pain of loss is the biggest. You know, I realize that no one is exempt from pain. <laughs> Thank you. I told myself not, I'm not going to cry. Failed. Um, you know, the, the fear of God that overwhelmed me 25 years ago, the fear that, you know, God can take someone's life just like that. This powerful, mighty, you know, scary God. And the insignificance of my life that I'm just a you know, speck of dirt in his vast universe of God, you know, and that God owes me nothing, that he owes no one, and that I mean nothing to God. But by God's incredible, amazing grace, I realized that this fearful, awesome creator, God, 
is actually telling me through the Bible that he loves me so much that he wants to have a relationship with me. That he loves me so much that he gave up his only son, Jesus, to die a horrible and shameful death on the cross for me. You know, over the years, um, my favorite book in the Bible uh, became Psalms. Um, I was actually really thrilled when Ian announced they were going to do a series on Psalms. Um, when I grieve and uh, when the pain is often unbearable, and they still are, um, or when I'm scared, um, I recite these verses from Psalm 71, and that's how I want to end. Um, In you, Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, rescue me and deliver me. Turn your ear to me and save me. Be my rock of refuge to which I can always go. Give the command to save me for you are my rock and my fortress. God is good. Our God is good. He is good. Thank you, Kenna. How do we worship when we have things like that in our lives? You don't need to muster joy. You don't need to conjure happiness. You take it to a loving creator. We're going to gather together around the table in clusters. And if your worship looks like approaching that table with tears. Bring those tears. Whether they're yours or whether you are shedding them on behalf of another, whether you are lamenting for another, bring those tears to the table where he hosts us, the God who provides us with words to express to him our pain.